Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. With 326 episodes, The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes aired from 1939 to 1950. As usual, we remind you to like and follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and keep the golden age of radio alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com to our Patreon page. Give that donate button a click. And now, The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, it's time for our weekly visit to Dr. Watson, genial friend and colleague of the great Sherlock Holmes. Good evening, Dr. Watson. I trust I'm not intruding? Not at all, my dear fellow, not at all. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. You know, Dr. Watson, I've been struck by the remarkably large number of signed photographs of titled personages and notables that ornament the walls of your study. Mementos of your active career, I presume? Yes, though I must admit most of them are clients of Sherlock Holmes rather than grateful patience of mine. Well, this picture, for instance. Naturally, I recognize the photograph of the late Royal Highness... No, 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 no names, Mr. Bell. I I beg you. Holmes and I always referred to the gentleman question merely as uh, Mr. Edwards. And what did you and Mr. Holmes do to cause his royal... I beg your pardon, Mr. Edwards, to inscribe his photograph in such affectionate gratitude? Oh, nothing of any great importance, I assure you. Merely that Mr. Edwards had become a trifle entangled, shall we say... The little dancer at Maxim's in Paris, a young lady rejoicing in the appellation of uh, Fru Fru. <laughs> Quite a delightful little bit of fluff, too. <laughs> <laughs> I gather that Sherlock Holmes settled the matter to Mr. Edwards' complete satisfaction. Uh, very easily and very discreetly. But it led us into one of the most curious and singular affairs of Sherlock Holmes' career, and one which I don't believe would ever have been solved had Holmes not been a distinguished amateur on the violin. I call it the adventure of the genuine Guarnerius. Sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. But if you don't mind a momentary interruption... Not at all, Mr. Bell. Go ahead. Men, there's a famous saying about locking the barn door after the horse has been stolen. Well, the same applies to the hare. Once bald, bald forever, they tell us. But you can make the most of the hair you've got. And you can't begin too early. That's why I want to tell you about Kreml hair time. Cremel contains very special hair grooming ingredients found in no other hair tonic. Cremel makes the hair stay better groomed longer, with that natural, greatly desired he-man look. Never greasy, never sticky. But Cremel does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. A massage with Cremel actually helps stimulate circulation in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp always feels so alive, so invigorated after applying Cremel. This highly specialized hair tonic also has an excellent lubricating effect on a dry scalp. It makes dry, brittle hair that breaks and falls feel softer and more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml hair tonic at any drug counter. You'll be delighted with its extra advantages. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... How about the adventure of the genuine Guarnerius? Well, the British ambassador to France, Sir Hubert Ashley, had invited Holmes and myself to a reception at the embassy in Paris in order to thank us both for successfully concluding the rather delicate affair of uh, Mr. Edwards. The ballroom was a blaze of light. The guests were dancing. By Jove, Holmes, have you ever seen anyone more attractive than our host's wife? I must say that Lady Ashley is really the finest type of English beauty. Sometimes, Watson, I envy you the directness of your mind. What do you mean? When you look at a beautiful woman, you see only beauty. Well, what on earth would you expect me to see? In the case of Lady Ashley, my dear fellow, I notice her elderly husband, her many gallant admirers, and I think, what a motive for murder. Oh, really, Holmes? Oh, Mr. Holmes... I trust our guest of honour is enjoying himself. Very much indeed, Lady Ashley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, may I introduce a very dear friend, Monsieur Jacques Merivaux, who has known me more years than I care to remember. How do you do, sir? Good evening. Yes, I think I can claim to be Lady Ashley's most devoted cavalier. 
having first made her acquaintance when she was just over two hours old. <laughs> she wept bitterly the moment she saw him. Yes, but I've been trying to make up to him for it ever since. During the time we're in Paris, Monsieur Maribault, I've been promising myself the pleasure of a visit to your famous music shop. You should be honored, Monsieur Holmes. I've heard, of course, that you play the violin. Merely as the veriest amateur. Incidentally, I'm looking forward eagerly to hearing Monsieur Drenko play this evening, Lady Ashley. I was unfortunately out of London during the only recital he gave this season. He's a great artist. Yes, he comes from one of those little countries down the right-hand corner of the map, doesn't he? I always heard the fellow was a bit of a bander. You have an opportunity to judge at once, Watson. Our host is approaching with a gentleman in question in tow. Oh, Holmes, there you are. Monsieur Drenko has been asking to meet you. Monsieur Drenko, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do, you do? Holmes? Hubert, if you'll excuse me, I must see to our other guests. Until later, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Yes, yes, indeed, of course. Dr. Watson and I are looking forward to hearing you play, Monsieur Drinko. I always enjoy an appreciative audience. Uh, tell me, Mr. Holmes, might I speak with you alone for a moment? Uh, come along, Mariver. You promised me your opinion on that 83 champagne. Yes, it sounds vintage, but I, I find it too dry. Oh, well, Monsieur Drinko? I said alone, Mr. Holmes. I have no secrets from Dr. Watson. Very well, then. It so happens that I find myself in a slight uh, predicament. I thought that with all your experience, you might advise me. As a social favor, Monsieur Drenko? Gladly. If, of course, you would like to come to the tea at my hotel tomorrow and bring your violin to entertain my guests. I beg your pardon. Oh, <laughs> I understand, Mr. Holmes. We professionals must each respect the other's métier, must we not? It would be preferable. Yes, I told you what sort of fellow he was. Nevertheless, Mr. Holmes, I still ask for your advice, and I will expect to pay the customary fee. You see, I find myself a trifle involved. Only a harmless flirtation, of course, but I did write one or two indiscreet letters to one of the girls at Maxim's, and now the greedy little thing threatens blackmail. Hardly an unusual situation, Mr. Drinko. For myself, for my reputation, I do not care, you understand. An artist is an artist. But uh, there is my wife at home. I must think of her naturally. You think of her a trifle late, aren't you, Omar? So you can see there might be unpleasant mm. results if Frufru... Frufru of Maxims? You know her. Oh, we're not unacquainted with a young person, eh, Holm? Uh, from my rather brief acquaintance with her, I think the matter may be settled rather simply. Ah, I shall be happy if you will handle the affair. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The Sir Dranko, whom we're all very happy to welcome here this evening, will now give us the pleasure of his incomparable music. <laughs> Ah, gentlemen, Mademoiselle Frufru's dressing room is right here. Oh, Papa. <laughs> I say, Holmes, did you notice that girl just passed? The one wearing just those little, uh, little thingy jigs? Quite. I also noticed, Watson, that backstage at Maxim seems to be one place where you not only see, but also observe very closely. Oh, hello, hello, Monsieur Holmes. Good evening. Oh, I have not expected to see you in that cute little Dr. Watson oh, again so soon. <laughs> but perhaps this time it is pleasure, huh? Not business. Oh, I say not, Mademoiselle <laughs> Mademoiselle Frufru, it was only because I thought the gentleman we have agreed to refer to as uh, Mr. Edwards was at least as culpable as you that I persuaded the French police not to prosecute you in that matter of his mother's jewels. But, Monsieur Holmes, that little matter, we have settled it, uh, have we not? The charge is still pending, mademoiselle, and at a word from me could be followed up. But why should I you? I also happen to know that the Marsovian embassy is most curious regarding the attraction which brings Prince Danilo so frequently to Paris. That uh, also does not concern me at the moment. Assuming, of course, that you return at once all the letters that were written to you by Monsieur Drenko and that you cease from molesting him in any way. Oh, je comprends très bien. Oh, I see. Well, Monsieur Holmes, uh, since you have put it so convincingly, I am rather tired of listening to a soul fully played violin. Monsieur Drenko may have his letters back. Here they are. Thank you, mademoiselle. I knew you were a sensible girl. Good night. Good night, And now what? 
And now for a good night's rest. And in the morning, we can report to Mr. Drinko the satisfactory solution of what was perhaps our simplest problem. Well, I hope you charge him a stiff fee, Holmes. I still say that the fellow's a bounder. Good morning. I think Mr. Drinko is expecting us, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. What's the number of his room, please? Click, click. Send a message to the police. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Maribel, what's the matter? Mr. Drinko. Well, we're on our way up to see him. He's dead. Killed himself. What? Good heavens. Come, Maribel. Take us up to his room. The man's been dead for more than an hour, Holmes. Yes, no, not more, more than half an hour. Closer to an hour, I should think. I see. Marivaux, would you please ask that chap we passed, uh, the one who was painting the hall, to step in here for a moment? But of course. Curious. I wonder what could have been Drenko's motive in committing suicide. He's a painter, Monsieur Holmes. Ah, yes. Tell me, have you been working there all the morning? Uh, oui, monsieur, ever since eight o'clock. For over two hours, in other words. And were you working constantly in sight of this door? Absolutely, monsieur. I heard the gentleman in here practicing the violin for a little while, but he stopped almost an hour ago. Well, that puts the time of death at just about what I thought, Holmes. And you saw no one enter or leave this room during the entire time? No one. Oh, uh, except five minutes ago this gentleman went into the room. A few seconds later, he came running out calling for the police. Thank you. Your statement has been very clear. You may go now, but better not leave the hotel. No doubt the police will want to question you. Très bien, monsieur. I have never had such a shock in my life, monsieur Holmes. I came up to deliver a new violin that Drenko had ordered. And when I opened the door and saw him lying there, with his face all twisted up in agony... Yes, the common appearance of cyanide poisoning. Not very pretty, I'll admit. You'll note the characteristic odor of bitter almonds, Watson? Yes, indeed. And here's the empty bottle. Quite. The poison label on it removes any possibility of accident. Now, nobody could possibly have got in or out of the, the window. It's a sheer drop of, of four stories to the street. Look, Monsieur Holmes, this torn piece of paper. I found it here on the desk. It's his suicide note. Evidently written under the stress of considerable emotion, to judge from the writing. Hmm. It is intolerable. I utterly refuse to endure it any longer. Signed, Mihai Drenko. It's his handwriting, Monsieur Holmes. I'd swear to it. Hmm, yes. Unquestionably the perfect setting for suicide. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Well, Monsieur Holmes, a pleasure to meet you again, even if under such unfortunate circumstances. How are you, Inspector Bernard? Nice to see you again, my dear fellow. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. Dr. Watson and I have been carrying on for you until your arrival. Oh, thank you. And uh, may I pick your brains to ask what you have learned? A Marivo here discovered the body only a few minutes ago when he arrived to deliver a violin Drenko had ordered. The painter, you'll find out in the hall, has had the room under observation all morning and will assure you that no one else entered or left it. And the fellow stopped practicing about an hour before. Sets the time of death pretty accurately. Here's the suicide note, Inspector. I'm afraid we're presenting you with rather an open and, and shut case. Oh, well, Dr. Watson, a hard-working officer like myself welcomes the absence of any uh, mystery. And uh, here's the violin that Drenko was practicing on. Let me see it, Watson. Odd. Very odd indeed. You mean uh, odd that Renko should be practicing the violin until just before he killed himself? No, Inspector. That fact by itself would merely be singular. But listen to the violin on which he was practicing. Yeah, sounds all right to me. I confess, Monsieur Holmes, that I find no mystery in a man playing the violin just before he killed himself. Perhaps, Inspector, you may then be able to explain why a world-famous violinist like Drenko should do his practicing on a violin that is most unmistakably out of tune. But how should I know what a man would do just before he commits suicide? Suicide? This isn't suicide, Inspector. This is murder. <laughs> Men, once you get bald, there's nothing you can do about it. Science tells us it's impossible to grow hair on bald heads. But you can make the most of the hair you've got. 
And let me tell you, there's nothing better than Kreml hair tonic to do it. In the first place, Kreml does a marvelous job of hair grooming. It keeps every lock neatly in place, yet never looks greasy or sticky. Kreml contains very special hair grooming ingredients, the like of which have never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. But Kreml does lots more than just keep hair in place. A massage with Kreml helps stimulate circulation of the blood in the surface of the scalp. Your scalp feels so clean, so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry and brittle that it breaks and falls, remember, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. It also has a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. So remember, men, make the most of the hair you've got. Use Kreml Hair Tonic daily. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what happened in that hotel room when Sherlock Holmes told Inspector Bernard that Drenko, the violinist, had been murdered and had not committed suicide? Well, naturally, Inspector Bernard was rather surprised. As a matter of fact, it seemed to me that he was a bit huffy about it all. But, Monsieur Holmes, you cannot fly in the face of all the evidence we see before us. The bottle of poison clearly labeled, the suicide note unquestionably in his own handwriting... Dr. Watson's medical evidence that the man had been dead at least an hour, and the final confirmation of the man painting in the oil who tells us that no one entered or left this room until a few minutes ago. And against all this, Mr. Holmes, what have you to offer? A violin that is out of tune. Ah, zut alors. Nevertheless, Inspector, it is the crux of the entire case. But, Holmes, how can you tell what a fellow like Drenko would have done? I can assure you, Watson, that he would have done almost anything in the world except practice on this violin. No, Inspector, this was murder. I'll stake my reputation on it. Uh, it is only your reputation, Monsieur Holmes, that makes me hesitate at all. Give me 24 hours in which to establish how this murder was done and who did it. Since you ask it, Monsieur Holmes, very well. Thank you. Come, Watson. We have some busy hours ahead of us. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. Good day. Good day. Good day. And where are we off to in such a hurry, Holmes? The British Embassy. The Embassy? Why on earth? You should... evidently failed to notice during last night's reception that Lady Ashley left us very abruptly the moment Drenko joined our party. Her manner to him venged on rudeness. And that's so unlike Lady Ashley that I feel that an inquiry in that quarter may bear interesting fruit. May I ask, Mr. Holmes, the purpose behind this unexpected visit? In just a moment, Sir Hubert. I'd like to have Lady Ashley present yes, when I... Yes, Hubert? My maid said you wanted to talk... Why, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. I didn't know you were here. I'm afraid our visit concerns a professional matter, Lady Ashley. You see, Dr. Watson and I have just come from the room of the late Monsieur Drenko. The, the late Monsieur Drenko? I, I don't understand. Drenko has been murdered, Lady Ashley. He... Oh. Quick, Watson, catch her. Cynthia. Uh, she's quite all right. Looks nothing but a faint. If you will just ring for your wife's maid, Sir Hubert. Yes, I'll get her at once. I must say, Holmes, you certainly broke the news rather brutally. She took it pretty hard. Nonsense, Watson. What caused her to faint was relief. That was my object. I had to find out what her reaction would be. Here, Annette. You and Mary help Lady Ashley up to her room. Put it to bed. Oh, no, we, we must keep her quiet. A cup of hot tea will do her no harm when she comes round. Now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me. I'm sorry, Sir Hubert, but I must ask you to remain here with us for a few moments. Well, I, I don't understand. Uh, Sir Hubert, Lady Ashley's reaction to the news of Drenko's death was a good deal more pronounced than might be expected in the circumstances. I haven't the faintest idea what you're trying to insinuate. I insinuate nothing. I merely state facts. Would you prefer that I question her? Or will you tell me what lies in back of all this? Very well, Mr. Holmes. But I should like to spare my wife as much as possible. My only interest is in any light that she might be able to shed on the matter. Cynthia is a very young and very beautiful woman. Before we were married, she had... Well, how shall I put it? Uh, fallen under the spell of this man, Drenko. Now, I, I asked her no questions, but I know that he continued to have some strange hold over her. I had the impression that she hated seeing him and that he was forcing his presence on her, 
on those occasions when he was a guest in my house. Yes, I still don't believe anyone killed the fellow, but if someone did, it sounds like a good riddance. Unfortunately, Watson, we are not concerned with the equities of the murder, but with its solution. Thank you, Sir Hubert. You've been extremely helpful. Well, justice must be done, Mr. Holmes. But if ever I wish that your great powers might fail, it is now. I have no hesitation whatsoever in saying that I'm infinitely grateful to the murder of that swine drinker. Join me in a cup of tea? No tea, thanks. I'm rather trusting to the inspiration of music to assist me in resolving some of the more puzzling features of this case. Well, at least you can't complain of a scarcity of suspects. First of all, Sir Hubert, for obvious reasons. Possibly Lady Ashley. Great Scott, Holmes. What's the matter? Tea too hot? No, but have you thought of the possibility that Fru-Fru might have killed Drenko? After all, she might have been mad in love the with him. The possibility she... had occurred to me, but I discarded it. Oh, discarded it. By Jove, look at this glass here on the table. It's positively vibrating from, from that high note. A not uncommon phenomenon. As you must know, certain objects vibrate in harmony with certain notes. Uh, Watson, huh? get your coat. We oh? promised to pay a visit to Marivaux's shop. I think this would be an ideal time to discharge that obligation. Mm. Dingy little place, I must say. Founded 1821, huh? Looks as though they hadn't washed the windows since. But full of priceless treasures. As Marlowe said, infinite riches in a little room. I say, where's Marivaux? I don't like the look of that customer over there, the one with that bushy back beard and theatrical cloak. He looks like one of those bomb-throwing fellows. What you call them, uh, nihilist. You must remember, Watson, that music appeals to oddly assorted people. Well, of course, uh, mm-hmm. Professor Moriarty, after all, knows no peer in his interpretation of certain of the Bach fugues. Well, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, or is this other gentleman waiting? No, 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 I'm in no hurry. It's no wonder the fame of your shop is worldwide, Monsieur Maribou. I see you have some remarkable instruments. You see about you the fruits of a lifetime of devotion to the violin. <laughs> I must confess, Monsieur Holmes, that it pains me every time I sell one of my treasures. I can well believe it. And uh, have you made any further progress toward a solution of Drenko's death? I feel safe in saying that my investigation has gleaned a few pertinent facts. Would it uh, be indiscreet for me to ask what they are? Not at all. You yourself were present when I made the curious discovery regarding Drenko's violin being out of tune. And only a short time ago, while I happened to be playing my violin, Dr. Watson made a remark which threw further light on the case. Didn't you, Watson? Huh? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Sir. I don't know what kind of a violin you possess, Monsieur Holmes, but I'm sure you'll appreciate one magnificent example that I'd like you to try. A Guarnerius. The equal of any strad I've ever seen. I'm afraid it would be far beyond the reach of my poise. But you at least owe yourself the pleasure, the great experience of playing it. Here it is. Isn't it beautiful? Exquisite. If the tone's as mellow as that varnish... But of course. Why don't you take it into my private office and try it? No one will disturb you here. Thank you. I've never had the good fortune to test a guanine. Dr. Watson, while Mr. Holmes is amusing himself, perhaps you'll be interested in one of these bows. Bows? Oh, yes, yes. Horse hair thing with each other. Bows. Uh, there's more to it than that. There is only one family in all Italy, Dr. Watson, that possesses the great secret of making a bow like this one. Yes, it's all very fascinating, Mr. Marivaux, but Holmes must have made up his mind if he likes that fiddle by now. And I know he wants to ask you some questions. I, he told me that... Uh, good heavens, what on earth... He's lying on the floor. He must have fainted. Holmes! I'm afraid he's dead. Quick, Dr. Watson, go for the police. And give you a chance to plant a bottle of cyanide by my side? <laughs> oh, no. Watson, stay here and listen to Maribel confess how he murdered Drenko. You, you're alive? No, thanks to you. I took the trouble to dissect the violin you gave me and then played one of the others here to lure you in. He killed Drenko? But the suicide note... Elementary, my dear Watson. I would hazard a guess that it was torn from the end of a letter to Maribel referring to an unsatisfactory instrument. 
which was intolerable and which he couldn't endure any longer. But Holmes, Marivaux was nowhere near Drenko when he died. Marivaux had left a very oddly constructed violin with Drenko, presumably last night, knowing that it was Drenko's habit to practice each morning from eight till ten. Inside the violin, in place of a sound bar, Marivaux had put a thin glass vial containing cyanogen, the lethal gas which is identical in odor and effects with the cyanide. Good heavens! When Drenko reached the proper high note, the extremely thin glass vial cracked under the impact of the sympathetic vibration, releasing the deadly fumes through the F-holes in the violin. And the violin that Marivaux was delivering to Drenko when he discovered the corpse Precisely, the... Watson. He merely left that one by the body, planted the note, and carried off the fatal weapon and all proof of the crime in his now empty case. He made only one error. He neglected to tune the violin he left. Amazing, Holmes. I've listened very patiently, Monsieur Holmes, to your ingenious and utterly imaginary reconstruction. I suppose you can furnish a motive, too? I'd prefer to spare Lady Ashley the ordeal, Marable. But I have no doubt that it was in you she confided that Drenko had been blackmailing her on the strength of their earlier romance. But to convict a man of murder, you need something more than words. You need proof. You seem to be overlooking this dissected violin on your desk with which you attempted to murder me. I fancy that the sample of your handiwork with the vial of gas affixed therein will offer ample proof... You'll never send me to the guillotine. I'll kill myself first, but I'm going to take you with Drop me. Drop that vial, Marivaux. Precisely what I intend to do. Drop it and release the fumes. They will put a speedy end to all three of us. I've got you, Miss Marivaux. Give me that vial if you don't want a broken arm. Ah, uh, there. That's better. Good heavens, it's an analyst. I mean, Inspector Bernard. As you noticed when you commented on his beard and cloak, Watson, the inspector's tastes in disguise are a trifle flamboyant. <laughs> and uh, now, Monsieur Holmes, I must extend my thanks to you on behalf of the Sûreté. Not at all, Inspector. Your promptness in acting in response to my message undoubtedly saved Watson's life and mine. Thank you. Oh, no, Monsieur Holmes. Thank you. Oh, well, have it your way, Inspector. <laughs> And now, Marivo, come along. Phew. Rather too close a shave to suit me, Holmes. I say, that fellow Marivo was very ingenious. Quite. You know, Watson, I have one bitter regret concerning this case. Regret? I find that I have, despite all my protests, ended by acting for Drenko without a fee after all. <laughs> Just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us something about next week's story. But first, girls, some of the most beautiful women in the world are Powers model. And one of their outstanding characteristics is their shining bright hair. Now, here's how they keep it shining. Powers models use Cremel shampoo. This amazing, beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair. Revealing all its natural, glossy luster. My wife says cremel shampoo is wonderful for washing children's hair. How about that? Oh, yes, it would be. Because there are no harsh caustics or chemicals in cremel shampoo. And its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if you could only see how Powers Models' hair fairly radiates glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try cremel shampoo right away. You can get a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the adventure of the Sally Martin. The Sally Martin? She was a boat, Mr. Bell. Oh. A luxurious yacht. Holmes and I entered the case when her owner was found lying dead in his bunk. With a knife stuck between his ribs. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Illustrious Client. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting to be you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Sally Martin. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.
That concludes today's episode. We thank you, and we'd like to remind you to please donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.